So, I'm Sam Bown, and I'm here to talk to you about DOS attacks, and I've got some help in doing that. Which is very good. So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the hacktivists that have used DOS attacks because I find them interesting and they have dramatized how much damage you can do with the various kinds of DOS attacks. Um, at the peril of going to prison themselves for it, which is a drag, but anyway, it helps the rest of us sell security appliances and it helps me entertain students and keep them interested in learning how these attacks and defenses work. So um, you will be participating as victims. Now how many people brought a device to get killed? One, two, three, yeah, not very many. Four of you over there. Okay, that's kind of what I thought. Okay, because uh, Ryan, who's setting up a wireless network, says he probably can't connect more than 40 or 50 before it'll crash, and I didn't think there'd be that many volunteers to get their device killed. However, I was trying in the speaker room, and I believe this attack could be used to kill every machine at DEF CON from here. I was going to demonstrate a version of that, the not so lethal on a stage, but it wouldn't connect at all in the prep room, so I decided to skip that for the moment. But if any of you were unscrupulous, you could try it. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. So that's me. I'm on Twitter. And I teach at City College, San Francisco. And I've got two guests with me. I've got Matthew Prince here, um, who's going to talk about his inside dealings with LULSEC, um, which I was very pleased to have. In fact, I met him because both of us were deplored as immoral, evil people helping LULSEC. Because I retweeted some LULSEC tweaks that pointed to stolen data, which I thought was important. And he ran a service which they used to protect themselves from attacks. And so it'll be interesting to hear about that. And Ryan here, way over there, he's going to set up the network and kill people who wish to volunteer to be dosed with this attack because we could learn some new vulnerabilities here. Now they're not zero days because this, the attack I'm using here, I didn't write it and it's not new. It's been known for a year. It's just that an awful lot of people that manufacture devices don't care and have not patched it. So if anybody has any exotic devices, it would be interesting to see if they're vulnerable. Anyway, here's the summary of what I want to show you. The DOS circus is about the history of this stuff and the attackers that have been using it, and then I'll talk about the three kinds of DOS. Layer 4 DOS, where you use thousands of attackers to bring down one machine, usually distributed denial of service. Uh, layer 7 DOS, where one attacker can bring down one server or more. And the link local IPv6, router advertisement attack. I talked to you last year about IPv6, and I said it was going to bring a lot of security problems, and so it has. Um, it's given us a time warp when a bunch of things designed in 1993 are now back on our networks so the old tricks work again. And this is not really an old trick, but it's devastating and I'll show it to you. You can kill all the Windows machines on a network from one attacker. And again, you only need a few packets per second to do it. So uh, Julian Assange stirred everybody up by leaking U.S. secrets and uh, he published this mysterious encrypted file as his insurance and if any he ever gets irritated enough at the fact that he's being held in house arrest and perhaps going to be deported and stuff, he can release the secret key and reveal something terrible not yet specified. But so this stirred up these anonymous people that had gotten tired of just posting pictures of cats on 4chan and decided to save the world through denial of service, which makes a lot of sense to them, although not to me. So they started attacking, if anybody they could all agree to hate, they would blow them away. So it started with Scientology because it's pretty easy to hate the Scientologists. And uh, <laughs> then it went on to other people and eventually H.B. Gary Federal, this guy couldn't, um, he was supposed to be here but he was issued a court order about three days ago forcing him to not speak at the panel and tell what really happened for the inside story here. But anyway, in order to publicize his new government security contracting company, um, Aaron Barr said that he could find the people running LULSEC and expose them by doing a correlation of social networking. So what appeared in Twitter, he would correlate with what appeared in Facebook and elsewhere. And so they decided to take him down. And it was extremely easy. They got a team of anonymous members. Now anonymous was a low tech group, usually using really primitive tools, but a small number of them got together who were relatively skilled compared to the others. And they decided to take these guys down. They found a SQL injection and took over the email server. And then they sent emails pretending to come from the owner of the company asking him to please change the password, change the username, and turn off the firewall. Thanks. That's working now. <laughs> and once they were in, they took all their emails and dumped them on the web. Because the whole thing about these guys later became LulzSec, the whole point about them was complete irresponsibility. The fun thing is to take everything every sane person ever told you not to do and just do it. And then you laugh. Ha, 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 ha. So what would happen if I just dumped your whole email log out, everything personal, hurting who knows how many innocent people that just had something to say about their medical conditions? That would be a lot of fun, so that's what they did. And uh, they found a lot of real dirt in there. 
it looked like the, they were planning to do a lot of really nasty things from H.B. Gary. Um, and so then Anonymous decided to attack the Chamber of Commerce, having found out that they were involved in this with a Drupal exploit, again showing more intelligence technically than they, the Anonymous had, which mostly just used that low orbit ion cannon, which is pretty primitive. So the gesture gets in here. It is a demonstration of the power of a layer seven attack, although no one knows exactly what he does. His tool is secret, and I'm guessing what it does. But from people who have been attacked and kept logs of his packets, they've told me that I am correct, that what he's doing is essentially using a slow loris attack with some variations. And his plan here is to be right wing, essentially, where Anonymous and Lulzsec are left wing. He is pro-military, he comes from the military, and he tries to punch back at anybody that he regards as endangering soldiers like Julian Assange and Islamic Jihadist recruiting websites. And he brings them down with his tool and then tweets about it. He's prominent on social networking. You can go chat with him. I've chat with him. But he, but he doesn't have any partners, unlike Lulzsec. He works alone, and therefore he hasn't been caught yet. He understands military operational security. Nobody can betray him, something that Lulzsec forgot. Anyway, so he brought down WikiLeaks single-handedly and held it down for more than a day. And to prove it, I was chatting with him in IRC. And he said, OK, I'm going to turn off the attack and let it come back up. And it came back up. He said, now I'm taking it down again. And it went down again. So that convinced me that he was really in control of the attack. And uh, here's the Netcraft map of WikiLeaks going down for more than a day, thanks to the gesture. So um, that was his game. Then he decided to fight with Anonymous, because Anonymous didn't like him taking down WikiLeaks. And he's been focusing on them for about the last year, Anonymous and Lulzsec, uh, blasting each other apart with a variety of tricks, but among them, um, denial of service. And then the gesture got mad at Westboro Baptist. Now, these guys are also pretty easy to hate. I mean, uh, they have some ridiculous ha hatred of homosexuals. And then they also um, picket funerals. And they basically, their profit method seems to be to be annoying until someone finally punches them in the face and then sue. But the gesture decided to take him down, so he took down four websites with his tool, which he had ported to a cell phone. And from a single 3G cell phone, he says, he held down four websites for two months straight. And I don't doubt that, because I know I could do it, and any of my students could do it, and any of you can do it. If you just pay attention to this talk, it's not hard. The slow loris attack runs on Windows. It's not hard to do at all. And uh, that's how it goes. Now, Lulzsec continued on a rampage, hacking everybody in sight. At one point, they just opened up a telephone line, and you could call in, and they'd hack anybody you wanted. Um, they hacked US government, military, NATO, British government sites. They dumped the contents of the Booz Allen Hamilton database. When they dumped out the Arizona cops is when I got really mad, because um, that was real important. And they dumped out their names and their password hashes and the logins for all the emails. And when they dumped out the Booz Allen Hamilton password hashes, that struck me as outrageous. 150,000 password hashes. Half of them are cracked by the next day. So all the top military, their names and passwords are now out there where anybody can use them. I didn't think much of that. However, they also took down some games websites, which, seemed, which I didn't even notice, but it seemed to be what really caused trouble for them. Um, and they put up a website to announce all the stuff they took down and all their stolen data. And then hacked PBS and put up a silly thing. Um, and I was pretty irritated by that, too. I said, why would you hack PBS? Come on, guys. Um, and uh, anyway, now they've been caught. Largely, um, Ryan Cleary was one guy kind of on the periphery of LulzSec. They caught him in June, and shortly after that, they caught Tiflo, who was much more important to LulzSec. And just a couple days ago, they caught Topiary. So they really are just British teenagers, um, very messed up, hardly left their house. Uh, um, and their attitude of just taking down everything just for fun is um, a you know, it comes from just childish immaturity. You might wonder what makes them do this. They are just young and foolish, is why they think they can just take down every government website and just for fun. Anyway, by the way, they're supposed to be both here. They're both on Twitter claiming to be here. They said they were at the pool yesterday. The jester said he was here, and Sabu said he was here. I kind of doubt it, but maybe they are. Who knows? Um, Sabu is the main LulzSec person still at large and widely assumed to be on the way down because his friends have already been arrested, and this is what always happens. After they get the first one, they will betray all the rest because they don't have much in the way of operational security. Anyway, the technical part of this is you have a layer 4 DDoS is the simplest kind of attack. Um, and this is what was used to take down uh, MasterCard and Visa. They couldn't take down Amazon this way. Uh, Anonymous tried this. This is a protest which involves many people. Um, so the reason it does is the tool they use is the low orbit ion cannon, which is just a network stress tester, and it doesn't do much harm. 
So it takes a lot of people to bring down a website this way. But with the participation of 3,000 or perhaps 30,000 attackers, the number is not entirely clear, they were able to hold down MasterCard for more than a day um, and many other sites. And this is the kind of attack that uh, Kaspersky was talking about when they interviewed him a while ago and asked him how many infected machines would it take to bring South Africa off the internet completely? Or so I'm not sure it's South Africa, some nation. And he said it would take uh, hundreds of thousands of infected machines to do that. And I know that's false. I know it would take one 3G cell phone. However, he's not thinking of that kind of attack. He's thinking of the layer four attacks where it takes thousands of machines to take down one target. And it's really nothing more than just pressing F5 in your browser, F5, F5, F5. If enough people do that, you get the slash dot effect. The page goes down. It is an allow service of a sort. It's just a very weak primitive one. The more powerful ones, one like the Solaris attack that Arsenic came up with a couple of years ago, and there were many uh, previous versions of the same thing. Here you do something smarter. Instead of sending a complete request to the web server and just sending a lot of complete requests to the web server so it has to work too hard to serve them all up, you send it something that will jam up the web server. Um, an HTTP GET request to get a page from a server looks like this. You have the layer two information and the layer three information and down here you've got the GET which is several lines of information. And if you just send part of the GET and you never send the rest of it, then the network assumes that you're on some kind of unreliable network and the packets have been fragmented. And so I've got the first half of it and the other half is still coming, so it waits for the other half. And that ties up incoming lines. And it's extremely powerful, and I'll show it to you here in a couple minutes. Um, that's the uh, slow loris will freeze all available incoming lines and all you need is about one packet per second and it stops an Apache server dead. Um, are you dead yet is another similar one, but it uses posts and it affects IIS. IIS is not affected by the Solaris attack with incomplete GET requests. But it is affected by incomplete post requests. Uh, there are other variations of it now. There's one using Keep Alive DOS that works. I tried that and it's somewhat effective. It's not as powerful as the Solaris attack, but it's another way to send um, requests that make the server do a lot of work. Uh, the gestures tool presumably uses one of these principles. It's, he calls it Xerxes. It is a graphical interface. Looks like it runs on Ubuntu Linux to me, but who knows. And then it has this attacker. One important thing about layer seven attacks is you can run them through an anonymizer so you don't go to prison. Um, the low orbit ion cannon does not enjoy this feature because it has to send a lot of traffic from you to the other end. If you try to run it through the Tor network, it'll just choke off your attack and it'll just bring down the Tor network because it's like a flamethrower. It burns everything between you and the target. Of that, the um, Slayer 7 attacks are like a guided missile. It just send a few packets that do no harm to anything, and when they get to the server, blam, the server becomes unavailable. So you can run it through an anonymizer which is what he does, which means that not only can they not find out where it's coming from, but they also can't protect from it by any kind of simple firewall rules that search by source address because all the packets come from different source addresses. Although, if you block all Tor exit nodes, which you should all do, that will stop them from using Tor and they'd have to use something else like a botnet of compromised machines to do it and that would make it a little harder. But anyway, his tool starts, runs this thing through an anonymization network and then brings down the target and it's independently uh, a series of tests to the target and when the target goes down, then it sends out one of those tweets, Tango down. Anyway, that's where we are uh, up to maybe two years ago, these things were running. Um, the link local DOS is much newer um, with IP version 6. You're using IP version 6 if you have any version of any modern operating system, any modern version of Linux, any Windows, Vista, or Windows 7, or, I, or Windows XP if you turn on IP version 6, although it's not on by default, and your servers, your domain controllers, your DNS servers, your email servers are all using IP version 6 whether you like it or not, unless you have gone out of your way to turn it off. And like any other unwanted service, if you're not using it, it's opening you to the attacks. So in IP version four, when a machine joins a network, unless you're weird enough to be using static IP addresses, which most people aren't, your machine boots up and it asks the router, the DHCP server, I need an IP. It says, okay, use this IP. Then there's another back and forth to make sure nobody else is using that IP. And it's the end of the game. There will be no further DHCP traffic until you restart that machine or until a long time passes, like four days. That's a pull process. I need an IP, I ask for an IP. But IP version six is not normally um, done in that fashion. IP version six is generally, addresses are distributed by router advertisement. So the router pushes out a, a router advertisement and says, I am the router, everybody stop what you're doing and join my network now. 
everybody has to stop, make up an address, and join the network. Um, it's a broadcast packet, although the purists will tell me there is no broadcast in IP version 6, but there is something called multicast to all nodes. So the difference, uh, the difference between these things is theological in nature, and I don't intend to go into it. But the, the point is, the router sends out one packet that goes to every node, and every node now has to join the network, which doesn't seem that bad. Here's the router advertisement packet going to a multicast to all nodes address, FF02 um, colon colon 1 and telling people what network to join. The problem is you can send out a lot of router advertisements. And when you do, the poor target joins all these networks, and that would be all right, except that um, Windows is extremely inefficient at doing that. So let me show you a few of these attacks. Um, I should have some virtual machines set up. Now, this is how I do it in class with my students. Um, I use virtual machines on an isolated network. Um, and I was, when I first, well, I'll, I'll tell you a little more when I get there. So let's start with the old-fashioned attacks. Here I've got a Backtrack 5 Linux machine, and it's running as a web server. So if I go to localhost and refresh, I put up a web page here with a picture of cat. All right, so um, it's handing out that glorious web page. Now, if, in, if you run this page, you can see the status of your server. And let me see if I can figure out how to turn off some junk to save some room here. Can I right click? Let's see, view, toolbars, ah, good. Get rid of toolbars. Come on. Use toolbars, bookmarks. There, that's getting somewhere. Okay, now, that's the server status. And down here, these are the current connections. There's one connection waiting here, and all the rest are available, of hundreds of connections available. So this server can handle hundreds of people viewing that web page. So if I go over here, and this guy views that web page, um, it should show up here as another connection, and so it does. Now I have a couple connections. So now let's attack this poor Linux machine from this Windows machine. We'll start with the old-fashioned stuff, um, the low orbit ion cannon. Let's get these things out of my way. All right, the low orbit ion cannon is here, the thing that anonymous people use as a shortcut to go into prison. And um, <laughs> I'll need an IP address here. Uh, let me join this. There we are. Okay, 192.168.1 HTTP, 192.168.198.173. Hopefully I got that right. Yeah, it looks pretty good. 198, 173. Okay, so this attack goes here. I need a little more room on my screen. Come on, come on. Okay. This is Lion. It lets you drag the corner from the middle now, and, but it doesn't seem to refresh this page in any hurry. Well, that's irritating. Turn to your computer. Well, I don't like virtual machines much, but under these conditions, I'm kind of forced to use them. Uh, it seems. Do what? Uh, well, it won't even respond to anything I do right now. <laughs> this is fairly common. Um, I might have, to restart, might have to restart that one. Oh, there, it finally responded, I think. There, that's good. That's right. It's just a little slow. I'm sort of getting used to this. All right, so now I have to lock on until the number appears here. Yeah. There we are. Number appears there, and now I can do different kinds of attacks here. And I would like to scroll down, but I don't see a scroll bar because I'm being hosed here. Um, pardon me. All right, I'll have to go to full screen. That's the only thing I can do. I make it big enough so I can see what I'm doing. All right, because the low orbit ion cannon, in addition to sending you to prison, isn't very well written. It doesn't let you see what you need to see too well. All right, so I'm going to send um, HTTP requests here, and um, I need to get to the fire button. There, I'm in charge in my laser. Whoever wrote there, now it should be there. It's sending stuff, numbers. Okay, it's sending complete requests back to my poor target, which is here. So my poor virtual machine here will now show that people are using up the connections. And there they are. See, it's filling up with a bunch of C's. 
Now those C's are connections at the web server. It is gradually filling up here, so it's using up all the, the, the web server can do. But what it's doing is complete connections. They form a connection, they download that little web page, and then they wait to time out. So this does fill up all the connections and make the web server unavailable, but it does it in a very weak way because each connection terminates normally and then just ends its time normally. So it only ties it up for a couple of seconds. So that's what this one does. Uh, let me get back to my virtual machine, which is here. So, all right. And let's stop that one. That should have stopped it. And get rid of that one. Let's do the slow Loris one, which is much more powerful. And OWASP wrote a Windows version of it, which is really nice. And it's also small enough that I don't need to be have such a big window for it. All right. So now I have to put that address in here, 192. Give me a break. Uh, I could get it out of here, couldn't I? Yeah, that would be fun. Copy it from there, put it in here. OK. Now this is going to run that attack. Let me just get this back to normal. Since I'm no longer attacking it, it goes back to normal. Only one connection. There's an extra one there. I don't know what it is, but I'm not worried about it. Now I run that attack. There we go. Now if I refresh this page, you see it's filling up, and it's filling up this time with R's. Those are pending requests. Each one of those will take 400 seconds to time out by default. So you don't need to send very many of them, and it uses up all available incoming lines, and this server is toast. So um, that's the slow Loris attack, and the HTTP post attack is similar. So it's very powerful and very dangerous, and now it's this easy. Um, and when you stop, it will recover. It recovers pretty fast in this case. I don't know why it's not taking 400 seconds, but maybe the default timing in Apache on Backtrack 5 is different than what I think it is. I'm not quite sure what causes that. But anyway, now that we've shown you how to kill Linux from Windows, let's go the other way with the more powerful attack. Let me clear all this stuff up and set up my poor Windows machine to show you the evil that is about to happen to it. So if I go here and do ipconfig slash more or pipe more, You'll see this machine is an ordinary Windows machine. I put on a static address of 2 colon colon 2 and IP version 6. It's got an IP version 4 address and really not much else going on. Now let me bring up uh, a task manager window because that's the interesting way to see the damage that's going to happen to this machine. Task manager shows the CPU is now at 0%. So let me shove these things over near each other and shove it over to the side. There's my Windows machine just sitting there. Now if I send it some IP version 6 packets here. Um, I'm going to do fake router 6 first. Fake router 6. This is the THC IPv6, IPv6 attack suite from Van Housen in, in, uh, in Europe someplace. And I do that on ETH1. And I'll send it uh, def con. I can't get an N though, but I can get that far of def con. I'm going to send that. Okay, now it's sending some packets, advertising that network. Don't need to wait any longer. All the devices on that network have been commanded to join it. And there it is. It's made an address starting def co. Now this is what's supposed to happen when you add a router in the normal course of events. I add a router, it advertises its prefix, everybody joins, and the game's over. But if I send a flood of unwanted packets at the rate of hundreds per second, ETH1. I'm going to stop it very soon. There. After each dot is 100, I've sent about 1,000. Um, this is now at 100%, and it's just going to sit there at 100% for a long, long time. And, um, yeah. and, and what's worse is it's but I, I got this far. I was trying to make a project for my students sitting outside a coffee house. I said, well, this is fun, but the problem is it's killed it so bad that you can't see the addresses. If you run ipconfig, now if I stop it really fast, this will actually respond without waiting forever, and you can see what it's done. And that's why hopefully I stopped. There we are. As you see, it's joined all these networks, it's page after page of networks. That's what it's doing. And it's still adding more to that list at the rate of about five per second. So this is all right. But when I first tried it, I ran it for a while. Nothing seems to happen. Hey, my Windows machine doesn't respond at all. What happened here? I said, well, this is no fun. Students don't learn anything. They can't look at the damage. So I thought, well, this is a bad project. What do I do? And then I thought, hey, wait a minute. This would kill the domain controller and the email server and everything. This is really bad. This is so bad I can't tell my students at all. I better tell Microsoft quietly. <laughs> so, so I sent out a tweet. 
I mean, at first I did this to send out a tweet saying, hey, this attack hurts Windows 7, not surprising. And then I said, hey, you know, I need a security contact inside Windows. So Ed Bott and other people on my Twitter feed immediately gave me good people inside Microsoft, and they sent me to the right people. And within two days, I had an official answer from Microsoft saying, yeah, Van Housen told us about that a year ago, and we don't care. We're not going to do anything about it for current versions of Windows. We do not care that Windows Vista, Windows 7, Windows Server 2003, Windows Server 2008, and XP are all going to die at the drop of a hat. Um, we may put in Windows 8 or Windows 9 or something if we have nothing better to do. I said, fine. If you're going to be that way, I'll tell the whole world about it. And I gave it to my students for homework, and I said, use an isolated network. Don't kill every machine at the college, because you could kill every machine at the college including our servers and everything else, and my students did not kill the whole college with it, which is nice of them. Um, <laughs> therefore, I'm still working there. I'm not out on the street with a tin cup. And so, uh, anyway, that's the power of that attack. Um, and so let me talk a little bit about defenses, but I think before I do that, I'm going to hand it over to, to um, Matthew here. The only thing I want you to do is if you would like to try this. Now, Windows machines are vulnerable to this, and one version of BSD Unix is vulnerable to this attack. Windows, um, Mac OS is not. If you look at my Mac here, um, ifconfig, it will show, um, yeah, you see them here. I didn't see it. Let's try um, pipe more. There we are. See, the Mac got the attack too. The Mac is the host. And as you can see, it joined some of these, uh, those are 2001s, well, let's see. Um, it joins, I think those, yeah, those are useless networks. It joined some of those useless networks, but it didn't join them all. Well, I think those might be from DEF CON. But anyway, what you see, if you expose the Mac to it, it joins about the first 10 and no more. It has the sense to ignore all router advertisements after the first 10 for some period of time, which is a pretty good defense. And that's what I think Microsoft should do in Windows, but they are not interested in my opinion. Um, Cisco patched it. Juniper didn't. But anyway, um, if you have any devices to test, Ryan's going to set up a network there and kill anybody that wants to join it. And if you want to participate in this, here's how you do it. There, you join a network called Do Not Use. And it's, a, it's WPA2 encrypted, and the password is Do Not Use. So if you join that network, he'll see how many people join and then run this attack and kill you. And if it kills you, it's interesting because other devices are vulnerable besides Windows and BSD. And if you have, uh, some people said they were going to bring interesting devices here. Any device that networks may be vulnerable to this, and I would like to know, and I'd like you to go to the question room afterwards and tell me so we can inform the vendor and get stuff patched, because I think a bunch of people are vulnerable to this and they don't know. But anyway, let me hand it over to you. You can tell them your story about LowSec. And then I'll come back and talk about defenses if we have time left. Um, your stuff should be on the desktop. Let me dig down to it. Hey, Sam? Yeah? Is it do not use or do not connect? Is it do not use or do not connect, Ryan? Do, do not, not connect. connect. Oh, do not connect. OK. Thank you. Okay, so its name is do not connect and the key is do not connect. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Um, Sam is the only person that I know who can make running a DDoS attack seem charming. Um, um, so my name is Matthew Prince and uh, I know Sam, we both live in San Francisco and we uh, both got sort of dragged into the Lowell security uh, kerfuffle um, uh, reluctantly. And so I'm going to tell you the story of how I got dragged into it and talk to you about some of the DDoS attacks that we saw during uh, the 23 days uh, that they were active and, uh, and then what we did to stop them. So on June 2nd um, at about 4.54 p.m. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time, uh, the Lowell Security uh, Twitter account announced that they had uh, finally gotten around to actually making a web page. What was pretty amazing was that within about 15 minutes, that web page was knocked offline by a fairly significant uh, denial of service attack. I don't, I don't know the details of, of this particular attack uh, because we hadn't been involved yet. About an hour after the web page was first announced, uh, Lulz announced that they had actually solved this problem uh, on a Twitter account. Um, and the only thing that had changed, as far as I've been told, is that nine minutes earlier, uh, they signed up for Cloudflare. 
Um, now, Cloudflare doesn't, we don't, we, we're a service, we make websites faster and we protect them um, from some attacks, but we don't really think of ourselves as an anti-DDoS service. So it was somewhat of a surprise for the Lowell security people to um, do that. It was even more of a surprise when an hour later, uh, Lowell security sent out a message to me um, saying, hey, we love your service so much, can we exchange RUM for a free pro account? I had no idea who Lowell's security was at this point, um, and so I tweeted back a tweet which my legal counsel has since told me to remove, um, which said, it depends on how many cases and how good the rum is. <laughs> they never sent the rum, um, and uh, we never gave them a pro account, but Cloudflare is free, and thousands of sites sign up for it every single day, and we typically don't have problems with them. These guys we had some more issues with. Um, and so over the course of the next 23 days, they wreaked mayhem in lots of different ways. And uh, you know, finally, on June 25th, they uh, called it quits. And what was interesting is that the way Cloudflare works were a reverse proxy, right? So all of the traffic which goes to Lowell's security passes through our network first. Um, which has two significant effects. The first is anyone who attacks Lowell's security um, was attacking us, uh, so that was, that was amusing. Um, and then secondly, it meant that Lowell's security was actually able to hide where their origin was, where, uh, where they were actually hosting um, from. And that's, that's a side effect of how our system is designed, um, but it was one that they used um, to great effect. Um, Sam actually contacted me a little while ago. He said he was going to do a talk on DDoS and would I, and we sort of talked about the experience and he said would I be willing to to share some information about it and again we have legal counsel and we're a real company and we have a privacy policy and even if you're an internationally wanted cyber criminal um, we try to respect the privacy policy and so I wrote the following email. There's a little bit more to it. Um, to the email account that we had on file uh, for Lowell Security on July 2nd, right after they had called it quit, saying, hey, I've been invited to talk about this at DEF CON. Uh, would you mind? And I didn't hear anything for quite some time. And then 11 days later, um, someone by the name of Jack Sparrow <laughs> So here I am. So I can talk about some things. I can't talk about anything, uh, everything. Um, I can talk about uh, things writ large. I can talk about how they affected us. Um, I don't want to get the host uh, necessarily that uh, they were using in trouble, so I'm not going to be revealing their exact IP addresses. But let me tell you a little bit more about what happened um, over those 23 days. So this is the actual traffic to Lowell Security's website. Um, over those 23 days, they received a little over 18 million page views um, as people went to that site. Um, you can see it peaked early, and then it's trailed off since then. Um, the website is still actually on Cloudflare, although the website behind it has been taken down. So if you go to it today, you'll see an Apache configuration page. Um, I don't know what they have planned next. What's interesting is that we can actually look at what is just the attack traffic and break that down. And you know, I'd say that this, this attack traffic um, up until the spike kind of in the middle there was, was almost just background noise. It was not something that we uh, were particularly concerned with. And, and in fact, what I say on a, on a slide in a couple of seconds is that the three weeks that Lowell Security were on Cloudflare was actually three of the quietest weeks for denial of service attacks that we had seen, which is strange because a lot of people were saying that they were attacking them. Um, there was this one spike in the center, um, but that seems to have been caused by a couple of very distinct events that they, that they engaged in, and, and I'll talk about what that is. And then I'll talk about exactly what the sort of attacks that we saw uh, for Lowell, against Lowell's, and what we did to defend ourselves, and, uh, and then the ones that were sort of annoying to us. Um, so one thing that was particularly interesting, this is on June 25th, this is the, the jester, I don't know who the jester is, um, Sam 
Sam's given me some background. Um, he publishes a web page. He spent a huge amount of time trying to figure out uh, what uh, the backing, where the, where the Lowell security site was, was hacked, and he proudly pronounced uh, what has become gospel, which was that www.lowellsecurity.com was at 204.197.240.133, and lowellsecurity.com was at 111.90.139.55. I know where the site was on, January, or on June 25th, and I will tell you it wasn't there. Um, at all. Um, in fact, they used seven different hosts over the course of 23 days. Uh, the original host was in uh, Montreal, Canada. Uh, they were briefly in Malaysia, um, but it was er in early June. It was That's the 111 address that's accurate. I don't know where the other address comes from. Um, most of the hosts that they used were actually US-based hosts, including one uh, large host that is specifically specializes in uh, DDoS mitigation. Ultimately, they're using German hosting, and that's where they still are today. Um, one thing that was interesting was that a lot of people claimed that they had found some way to knock Lowell's security offline, and they posted um, pictures online. This is actually a service that we offer at Cloudflare, which is if your backend origin server uh, goes down, then we'll actually show a cached version of this, and we put an orange bar across the top that says you're viewing a cached version, sort of like if you view as cache in Google. Um, what's interesting is that while a lot of the world was claiming that they had done this, what I think actually must have happened is that the Lowell security guys got kicked off their host, because for a brief period of time, for about a 36-hour period, what they did was they actually pointed their IP address at 2.2.2.2, which is an invalid, uh, there's no host, uh, there's no web server running there, I think they just picked a random IP address, and what that did was it caused our system to kick into the always online mode. Um, that actually caused that cache version to exist for a limited period of time until that cache expired. At that point, they pointed it back to a host for a short amount of time, then pointed it back to a fake address to get it up. I am not aware of any person or any time when the uh, Lowell security site was actually knocked offline um, in spite of the fact that a lot of people were trying to uh, do that. Um, on the other hand, they knocked a lot of um, people offline, um, which was interesting to watch. Uh, a lot of the attacks that we saw, you know, again, as I said, we were really surprised. We had everyone on high alert. We were watching for big attacks to come in, and the attacks that we saw were generally actually significantly less than we would have expected. Um, pissing off the hackers that populate Twitter is not nearly as dangerous as picking off, pissing off uh, the Chinese cyber mafia or the Eastern European cyber mafia or people that run really big extortion attacks, they run big DDoSs. Um, these guys, they run, you know, they're clever, but it's not, it's not the same, it's not the same league. Um, we saw some layer seven attacks that were relatively harmless um, while Slow Loris and some of those tools um, are, are interesting um, to attack an individual web server. Cloudflare was specifically designed not only to stop layer 7 attacks dead, but we actually then record all the IP addresses that are committing those attacks, which just makes it, I mean, it, it's actually, we, we actually are happy when people attack us over layer 7. Um, the more annoying attacks for us are the layer 3, layer 4 DOS attacks that we see. Um, but, you know, we run this, we run a network which is an any casted network. And what that means is that we have a bunch of machines, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of machines, running in 14 different data centers all around the world, listening on the same IP address. So that tends to take distributed denial of service attacks or high volume attacks and spread them out over a very large surface area, which makes it much more difficult to launch something like that against us. What is more interesting, though, what the annoying attacks that hurt us um, were, were a couple of different things. Um, the first was a someone had a really big network and a lot of traffic, and they pointed almost all of it at us, and it happened that they were geographically proximate or sort of network geographically proximate to our San Jose data center, and so they were doing enough bandwidth to our San Jose data center that what we did was we took all of our clients other than Lowell Security and we moved them to other data centers. No one ever noticed, um, but the San Jose data center for that period of time was only serving Lowell Security. Um, Kept them online, though. Um, 
Another, another attack which was really interesting, it's actually not a, a particularly big threat to most people, it was a threat to us, was uh, using Google as a reflector. So we have special rules that are in place for Google's IP addresses in order to make sure that we're never blocking legitimate crawler traffic um, from coming to us. And so someone who is actually very clever uh, found out that if they sent a lot of SIN requests with fake headers pointing back at our IP addresses to Google, Google would act back to those. And that actually created some issues uh, for for us uh, internally. Um, it was a pretty easy solution. We blocked the acts that, that didn't have a SIN attached to them and we called our friends at Google and said, you'll never get origin traffic coming from this, so just firewall it off. And that was solved within a few minutes. Um, but that was, a, that was actually a clever attack that looked at the nature of how our system worked and challenged us based on that. Um, the last one, which was the most annoying, Someone did a, a thorough uh, scan of our IP address ranges and found um, some exposed uh, router uh, con um, uh, interfaces that were, that were out there and uh, figured out the routers that we were using or just uh, dictionary attacked against the routers, we're not sure, and they were able to launch attacks that actually shut down some of our routers. And they were able to bypass any cast because those were specific to that. The solution, again, was fairly straightforward. We just blocked those IP addresses off to the outside network, um, but it was the, uh, it was the attack that, that actually caused us the biggest uh, problem and knocked a couple of our routers offline for a, a, f a couple of minutes. But largely, again, you know, when I compare the big attacks that we see when a client of ours uh, gets a letter in the mail that says, hi, I'm the helpful Chinese government agency. Um, by the way, we've detected on your network that someone is going to attack you. If you send us $10,000, you know, we can probably do something about it. Um, obviously not a real Chinese agency, um, and you, they, they really can do something about it because they're launching it. Um, those are big attacks. Um, these were relatively um, small uh, by comparison. Um, Sam, I think I'm losing power. So, um, yeah, if you can just make sure it's plugged in. So, uh, so a couple of a couple of things. Um, I think I got it there. Um, so, sorry about that. So a couple of things that were interesting. The first was, you know, again, when the Jester and all those guys were attacking, that's that sort of background noise pattern. What really started to, it seems, trigger pissing people off was when the LOL security guys went after Minecraft. Um, and, uh, and that was the real spike in traffic. And, uh, and then the drop back off in traffic. Uh, was was caused when they stopped attacking uh, Minecraft. In fact, internally in our office, the biggest debates were uh, whether, uh, in terms of whether we should drop them off our network or not came from the Minecraft aficionados who said, um, you're now causing me pain and that's not cool. Um, so I guess the lesson is that if, uh, if, you're, if you're going to um, you know, launch DDoSs against people to indiscriminately, don't pick on Minecraft. Um, so, you know, we, uh, we've watched, uh, I have very little information on who actually the LOL security folks are. I will say that one of the usernames that um, signed up uh, for the Cloudflare account is um, very, very similar to one of the usernames that's been arrested. I don't know if that means that it's just a coincidence or that they've actually been taken offline. We haven't seen much activity. They haven't moved their host around, and again, their website is down now. Um, but it was an interesting 23 days watching kind of the attacks and as all the world tried to take them down, uh, seeing how we could help um, keep it up for better or worse. So if uh, this is of any interest to you, I'm East Dakota on Twitter and, and we're Cloudflare. So thanks for having me. All right, thank you, Matthew. I really appreciate you coming to do that because um, I am trying to improve my game. Um, you know, for I've been a breaker for quite a while. Let me see if I can find my presentation. There we are. You know, I've been giving a lot of talks, and like ha attack is easier than defense. So my talks are always the same. I have this new attack. It blows everything away. Ha ha ha! And if you don't like it, tough. You have to like wait for Microsoft to patch it or something. Basically, you're hosed which is a common message you'll hear at DEF CON and other conferences, but I'm trying to move up. So um, uh, I told you this stuff. By the way, uh, there are some defenses. See, I'm trying to move into defense, which is tougher, 
Most of the time, defense is difficult. Now, if you want to block those router advertisement floods, you could turn off IP version 6. That will protect you, but IP version 6 is necessary and it does things you probably want, like home groups and uh, direct access. Um, you can turn off router discovery um, with a netsh command at the command line, and that will mean that your machine does not listen. So it does not do anything when it gets RAs, and it will protect it from this attack. It'll mean you have to put a static IP version 6 address on it, which is probably the right thing to do on a server. Um, you can block it with the Windows firewall, and you only accept router advertisements from the authorized router, and that will protect your clients, although it's pretty easy to defeat that by just making rogue router advertisements that appear to come from that source address, but it will stop the attacks to some extent. And Cisco makes a switch with RA guard. Um, Cisco patched their own vulnerabilities for this um, as soon as they were told by Mark Hausa, and they made a proprietary protection for your network. So if you buy a Cisco switch with RA guard, okay, good, right on time here. Anyway, you can evade that pretty easily. Um, by putting in fragmented router advertisements, we'll go right past Cisco's RA guard. So for every defense, there is another attack. But anyway, as far as defending, um, my conclusion has been for a long time, the only reason your website is up is because nobody hates you. If even one person hated you, you'd be down. That's what the gesture proves. That's why I think the gesture is so important for network security. He proves that just one angry man can take down a lot of websites and you're helpless, basically. Now, it's not entirely true that you're helpless, but the defense seems to be a little difficult to put in. I, I tried playing with some defenses. You can use mod security. Now, in a laboratory condition, mod security's latest version has an anti-layer 7 DOS feature, but all it does is stop too many connections from the same IP address, so it will save you from a test on your network with that OWASP tool, but it won't stop the gesture because he goes through Tor or some similar network and all the attack packets come from different networks. Uh, you can pay a service like Akamai to protect you and they'll use a few tricks to protect you. Um, you can put in a load balancer. The load balancers will protect your server by only letting complete requests make it to the server but the load balancer itself will go down if you put in enough traffic. It's a defense, but it's not a perfect defense. It took something like four times as many packets to free the load balancer in my test, so it's something. Um, you can also do things like counterattack. H.D. Moore had a good one here. Somebody tried attacking him with a botnet, so he re-pointed his DNS address back to their command and control server, so they blew themselves away. <laughs> and, and that's effective, of course, but it does mean your site is down while it's happening, and it's questionably legal. I mean, now he's taken the flame, just like if I had a shield and I reflected bullets back to shoot back at the bad guy shooting at me, I don't know. Anyway, there may be some legal issues there, but it did work, and it'll work against flood attacks like Anonymous with the lower but iron cannon. But I was very pleased to observe Cloudflare here, because I have the same t talk I give everywhere. There's this horrible attack, there's not much you can do, and now I'm contacting people out of the blue that have vulnerabilities exposed on Pastebin to try to get them to fix their stuff, and they're typically small businesses that don't know much, that don't have any security team, and I can't tell them to purchase and implement a extra server to protect your server, but what I could tell them to do is just use Cloudflare, <laughs> which is a free service, and that's not too hard to do, and it really will protect you, and I was very pleased to observe that it really stopped the gesture. The gesture really wants to take him down, and he really can't. It's the first thing I've seen that would do that, that you could easily deploy without you know, having an expensive network security team. So I'm going to be playing with it with my students next semester. We're going to be uh, setting up all these defenses and trying to blast through them and trying to make them good and strong. Defense is much harder than attack. Anyway, I guess that's it. Uh, did anybody actually get murdered here, Ryan? What's that? Ask them. Yeah. Did anybody's machine actually go down from attacking his network? Anybody want to talk about it? No volunteers. Well, you know, when you volunteer to ruin machines up here, you don't get too many volunteers. Okay, fair enough. So I guess that's it. I'll see you next year. <laughs> oh, there's a Q&A room.